from Carry the Load, these are Lessons from the Front. Stories of service and sacrifice from our military, veterans, first responders, and their families. I know a lot of tough guys, a lot of impressive guys. But how about this? Today's guest was a National Guard helicopter pilot, a state trooper, and a single parent all at the same time. Even deployed to Iraq during that time. Since then, she has survived cancer twice and even attended the FBI National Academy. In this episode, we go on the road to Rhode Island to sit down with Major Laurie Ludovici of the Rhode Island State Police, where she taught me a thing or two about being, well, one of the guys. I'm your host, Todd Boating. Welcome to Carry the Load's Lessons from the Front. Help people understand, what was it like to be a woman in a quote unquote man's world? I feel like I was a very, one of a very select few women obviously serving. There are plenty of women out there serving, but in this particular role, um, there weren't a lot of us around. Um, and even in my career with the state police, when I joined the state police in 1997, I was only, and I, have, I keep a list of every woman that's ever been on the state police. There's only been 42 of us ever Is in the right? history. And I was the 15th woman ever to be on the Rhode Island State Police. So by the time um, I became part of the state police, that was still a very male dominated, it's still a very male dominated field. Sure. So um, it's different. It's different. Um, I think initially as a young woman, all I wanted to do was be one of the guys. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just fit in. I wanted to blend in. I didn't want anybody to make anything um, special, no special accommodations. Don't treat me any differently than when you would treat anybody else. But as I mature and grow a little bit older, I realize that um, inherently we are different. Women can't, I can't be one of the guys. I can do the guy's job. I can hang out with the guys. I can try to be one of the guys, but I'm not actually ever going to be one of the guys. Right. Right. I'm always going to be a woman. I'm always going to have things that are very specific to me or to my to being a woman that they don't experience or understand so that begs the question um as it relates to qualifications with and i have to set this up right <clears throat> because obviously women in the military women in service in a quote-unquote man's world is it's a very controversial topic and there are those who are on one spectrum and you know just imagine old bubba you know, he has his beliefs and Bubba says, you know, that's not a place for a woman, you know, woman doesn't belong there, this, that, and the other. And then you've got, you know, those who are more along the lines of, um, you know what, I'm okay with it, but let's make sure that everybody, you know, if we're going to treat everybody equally, everybody should have the same, mm -hmm. you know, responsibilities and qualifications. Don't treat anybody any different. Because the only place where there are different qualifications mm -hmm. um, is in the physical standards, right? Yes. So everybody has to pass the same written tests. Yeah, I everybody, should have been more clear. You're correct. Yeah, everybody has to. So so it's a, it, you know, you you, you do a, um, an evaluation of a candidate based on a multitude of, of categories. Mm -hmm. It's not just their physical capabilities, right? right? Even for the military, even for the state police, you have to do a written test, you have to do a physical test. Um, with the state police, you have to then do an oral board, a background, a, a psychological test. There's so many things that we, we test for that are all standard. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's not specifically standard is the physical the physical agility, mm -hmm. right? For both the military and state police. Yeah. You have to look at what the job is you're asking them to do, and then you have to assess them on their ability to do what you're expecting them to do. You know, and I think a 40-year-old physical fitness test really wasn't doing a very good job of that. Um, yeah. I know the Army is leaning towards having everybody pass that basic test, mm -hmm. right? That basic annual test and having a male and female standard mm -hmm. because that's the basic, right? And then if you want to go be in the combat arms or if you want to go be in one of those, you know, real hard charging um, MOSs or military occupational specialties, um, you have to pass another set of standards that are developed for that job. So I don't know if you know that women have an advantage in the sit-ups. When we were doing push-up sit-ups and two-mile run, Women can do sit-ups much easier than men can. I have and that, to admit, I've never heard that. Please enlighten me. I'll enlighten you. It's because of the way our hips are formed. It's our, our, it's our physical composition of how our bodies are made, right? Just like men, it just, it is 
the difference between men and women, right? Okay. So take our differences, right? And instead of making it a divide for us, mm -hmm. like try to figure out how to how to evaluate the the physical difference between the, you know the actual you know difference between men and women and evaluate them so that you get the same outcome. And I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I think this is an important topic. Mm -hmm. If I'm in your shoes and I can meet those qualifications, but the bar is lowered for me so that I can certainly meet those standards, I'm a little offended by that personally because I want to be able to meet the same standards as everybody else. If you look at me and you go, you know, well, Todd's an idiot. And so let's drop the standards so that, you know, because we really like Todd. And we want to make sure that he can do this. That's offensive to me personally. Right. But, you know, I, I'm just. But I'm again, gonna... we're evaluating candidates and, and based on a number of criteria. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm not going to drop the the um, the academic testing, you know, just for you, Todd, because mm -hmm. you're an idiot. <laughs> um, I'm going to. It, it's it's a, it's a compilation of all of these things that go into play, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and that's what gets you in the door. And I and this is a point I want to make about the state police specifically is that baseline evaluation that got you selected and got you in the door got you into our training academy, just like it gets you into basic training, right? Like in the army, it gets you in the door. Mm -hmm. If you when I got into the into basic training, I had to then meet the same standards as everybody else in that same training group, right? You were an airborne. Correct. You, you were, you may have been a, a you know, a typist, clerk, clerk typist, admin, airborne you know, clerk typist. What, that's what I call it. But, uh, I mean, you jumped out of airplanes. How I many did. jumps did you have? Um, I did my five out of um, airborne school and I did, I, I, I say 10, I'm pretty sure it was 10. It could have been more, could have been a few less um, with my unit in the National Guard. Okay. So the thing that I like to talk about is I didn't just jump out of the ones at airborne school, right? So you come out of the C5, I think it was C-130, uh, 141 back then. Um, but I came back home and we have a C-130 unit in um, Rhode Island. And so I was able to jump out of C-130s. I jumped out of the, the tail of a C-7 Caribou. I also jumped out of um, Hueys, a Huey helicopter. So I have a bunch of different aircraft that I've jumped out of. Nice. For somebody who was only airborne, I was only airborne for like a year. I don't even know how long it was. It's a lot of jumps in one year. Yeah, it was, well, a little more than a year. It was before I went to um, OCS. So it was like that time in between uh, when I was um, enlisted. So it was... I mean, I'm a person who's afraid of heights, just so you know. Like, I can't stand up on a ladder without looking around. But it was probably, for my height, for my fear of heights, that was one of the most challenging things I've ever done. Really? Yeah. So did it, did it ever get where you're like, okay, it's no big deal now? No, no, never got like that. Yeah, that's... I, ever. I, I think that that's... Every time you're like... Well, because I, I didn't... good. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Because that kind of... Um, Pucker factor, if you will, keeps you mm -hmm. sharp. Yep. You know, and, and so that's Well, I don't think I would have ever felt comfortable standing in the door of an aircraft getting ready to go out of it, you know? I mean, I'm, now I'm used to flying them, so that's easy. You know, as long as I'm sitting up front, I'm good. Right, yeah. right. And so, you know, again, you just, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's a segue. Yeah. So you, um, you flew, you started off flying Hueys. Correct. Then you went into um, OH 7s. OH-6. OH-6, yeah. which is scout. similar to an AH um, the no, Marine it's a, Corps. No, it's a scout helicopter. So so when I first uh, went to flight school, okay. uh, women were restricted from combat uh, positions. Right. And in the state of Rhode Island, we had an attack helicopter battalion. So they had Cobras and um, OH-6s. So AH-1s right. okay. and OH-6. So, uh, so a scout, it was an attack um, helicopter battalion that had a company that consisted of the attack platoon and the scout platoon right so there's um the scouts go out and do their their little mm. scouting and the the guys come out with the big guns and the cobras and do the shooting so um i was not allowed to be in that unit because i was a woman did that bother you yeah a little bit Why? so i uh, well because i couldn't be part of the couldn't I, be one of the guys you know i had to be part of like a headquarters detachment aviation unit where I flew um, Hueys, which was fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then at some point they opened up the role, um, the role of the scout to women. Still couldn't fly the, um, the Cobra, but I could fly the OH-6. So I flew that for a, a very short period of time. Um, 
as a scout platoon leader and had a really good time doing that. Explain to people the difference between being in an attack helicopter, an AH-1, and a scout um, helicopter as an OH-6. What's the difference between the attack and the scout? Guns. Okay. Ammunition. Okay. <laughs> and what you're out there to do, right? So apparently as a woman, I was not allowed to fly the one that had the guns on it because that would have been too combat related, you know, too combat-y. Um, but they allowed us to fly the scout helicopters, which were just the ones that went out to search for the enemy. You know, you'd be out searching, scouting for the enemy. Treetop level, tiny little helicopter that's sort of quiet and can Still make its way. Still plenty of danger though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but at that time we weren't, we weren't at war. We weren't, we weren't right. deploying. We, we hadn't deployed or done anything. It was just training at that point. So, but that's changed. That has changed, yeah. That's definitely changed. And yeah. so then you ended up flying Blackhawks. Blackhawks. What was what was the deployment like, especially as a mother? So when we got word that we were deploying, um, I remember it very distinctly. It was Mother's Day, two thousand and four, mm. um, and my son was only six months old, and my daughter was about at that time five or six years old. I can't remember exactly in May because her birthday's in May so she was one of one of those um and on Mother's Day 2004 we got word that we were deploying um overseas um I think we knew you know maybe I can we knew we were going to Iraq we just mm -hmm. didn't know like where what we were up to yet um and and the interesting part of that is I don't think not ever once I ever thought about not going right it never occurred to me to not go um, so I'm back at home. Um, well, did you have a choice? It, well, well, we'll get to that. But okay. I'm I'm riding around in my state police car. You know, at night we'd ride pairs, and I'm riding with this this guy, uh, same age as me, maybe. And he's like, "So you're gonna go?" And I go, well, "Yeah, I'm gonna go." He goes, "Can you get out of it?" And I was like, "Why would I get out of it?" That's well, a like, I, question I, from a fellow trooper. Right. So what I'm saying is, there's just very different people's perspective of you're going to leave your kids oh sorry you're going to leave your kids and I was like well yeah this is what they've been training me to do for however many years this is what I've trained for this is the moment I've been waiting for and I had a fellow um a fellow co-worker say to me well can't you get out of it you know can't you, can't you do something and I'm like well, what would I want to do so that's interesting so that's the lead up to the deployment when I leave uh, when I left for my 14, 14 or so month deployment, my son was 11 months old. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter was six and I, I left. I turned around. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done is turn around and walk away and sort of leave them on the tarmac at the airport and uh, say goodbye. So. Did you ever have second thoughts as you were leaving? No, not a second thought. I mean, I certainly was... So the, there's different different emotions. I was going to say sad, but I don't know that I was sad. It was anxious. It's a lot mm -hmm. of anxiety, right? Sure. Um, I questioned whether um, I was doing the right thing by my children mm -hmm. as a mom. That's the thing I think I worried most about is whether I was doing something to harm them, right? I knew I was going to do my job, but by going to do my job, am I doing something that's going to harm my children by leaving them? So do you think there's a difference in how men and women view that i do i mean i don't I, and no offense to, to to any of the men and the dads mm -hmm. that also but as a mom um i feel like and, and i don't even really know how to explain this now that we're talking about it, but how to explain the connection that i have with my children and the and the commitment i made to my sure. children by ha you know and to turn around and walk away and not know whether you're ever going to come back. I think that's the key to that. At the time, nobody knows. Like I'd lay in bed at night and go, what? and I'd say to my husband, what if I die? You know, I'd be like, what if I die? And he's like, you're not going to die. He just keep hitting me. You're not going to die. Stop it. You're not going to die. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. So it's that unknown of going into, what am I going into? What am I, what am I doing to them? You know, my kids, what if I don't come back to them? You know? Yeah. But I, I think men, um, I, there's there's no question that men and women have a different um, relationship with their children. Right. Um, I mean, in our house, it's you know I don't know what did your mother say, <laughs> um, but you know it, it's there is a different connection there. I I think men have the same 
question mark, mm-hmm. but biologically, the maternal right. connection is incredibly And different. that's what I'm having a hard time explaining is I just don't know how to explain that pull that you have, you know, as a mom to your right. kids. Now, I left them in able-bodied hands of my husband who mm-hmm. did a really good job of keeping all 10 mm-hmm. fingers and toes. Um, and when I came home, they were all, you know, there. Everybody was Smi- intact and healthy. And that's, smiling, that's a good right? thing. Right. Great um, Tom. Yeah. But, um, you know, to think about missing, like when I, like when I got home, he was two, over two years old. Like I missed an entire year of his life as a baby. Like those years where that year where he forms his taste buds, he forms, he forms, he starts eating, he starts doing, and, and I wasn't there, you know, I wasn't there. And this is an 05. So remember there was no FaceTime. There was no, Right. right. There was wait in line for the tent to get to the phone. So you could try to make a call. So I came home um, and so the kids were fine, but there was a big dent in the refrigerator. And I'm like, what happened to our refrigerator? And he's like, and it was like one of the days we had like, just the phone call didn't go the right way. And you see where this he, is going. He was frustrated. There was like a hole in the wall where he chucked the poor kids, uh, TJ's, uh, the top to his um, high chair. Just got frustrated one day. So, so in the end, ultimately, I wouldn't have been able to do my job. I wouldn't have been able to do what I did. I wouldn't have been able to deploy if not again for my husband and his support. You know that it goes back to having the right people around you. you know? So on deployment, you're a pilot uh, on a Black Hawk. Um, can you recall a moment though where you you went, man, this is why we do this. This I think this just every makes day. it worth it. Yeah, I think every day we were mission oriented. I think. I think um, being part of that team that um, and being part of that mission and being part of, you know, what I had trained my whole life for, mm-hmm. right? I think I had, at that point, I had like 18, 19 years in. Um, and I was like, this is what I've been training to do and here we are doing it and seeing it in operation. I was, um, we were on an air base that was a 24 seven operation and just in and out, in and out all day, every day, you know? We had a hospital on the other side, so there's a lot of medevac stuff going on over there. Um, yeah, I think, I think I had a couple of certain couple of missions where I felt were, you know, were stood out a little more prominently. I, you know, fly the generals around so they could visit the troops and see what was going on. Um, but I'd also sometimes fly some members of the Iraqi, you know, Iraqi army around so we could help them Mm -hmm. fix problems they were having trying to regain control of their country. Um, You know, there was a lot of really interesting things we did. And one of the most, uh, you know, the best things we did was we picked up troops who were going to go home on leave. Tell me about that. Yeah, no, a lot of times they were excited to get out of there. That was their, they they were going to get their break, you know. Um, So I felt it was a privilege to be able to get them to where they needed to go so we could get them you know, met a lot of different interesting people. It was it was really, yeah. So I would imagine, just having been in the infantry myself, that some of these guys, as excited as they were to get out and go see their family, they were just as excited to get Come back in. and be with their buddies. Right, with their be buddies. with the troops, right, exactly. Tell me what it was like coming home and mm. seeing the kids. So... Coming home on my leave for my two weeks of leave was amazing. I'll tell you, I, I flew, you fly commercial, so mm-hmm. by myself in my you know regular clothes. And I came up the jetway and uh, one of our trooper friends had let my husband get to the gate so he and the kids could meet me at the gate. And I'm gonna cry now, oh my God. Um, and I came out of the jetway and TJ walked right up to me I don't know, he's probably two, because it was October, yeah. So he just grabbed my hand and said, hi, mommy. And he just grabbed my hand, and we just started walking like nothing ever happened. That's special. Yeah. So so leave was good, because it was two weeks. It was fun. Yay. And then I went back, and then coming home um, at Christmas was great. So we got home right before Christmas, and now I need to just sort of compose myself here. Um Coming home at Christmas was great because it was Christmas. Yeah, you know, you're like, you're home, you made it. And uh, everybody's celebrating, everybody's happy. And what happened after the holiday is like the reality set in um, of what we had just endured, of what we had just gotten through. And um, it was really hard. 
to reintegrate back into um and and i know we talk about it now we're, we're doing such a better job of helping soldiers now of reintegrating back into but back in 05 06 it was still new i don't think they really we, none of us really knew what we were doing or what we were up against there wasn't a lot of services there wasn't a lot of i mean i i suppose i could have reached out for help but you know people don't reach out for help they don't want nobody wants to know you're hurt and nobody wants to know you're struggling we were a new family um we were only married for a couple of years before the deployment. We had the baby. I had my daughter. Um, we had our daughter. And um, what happened was we struggled. My husband and I struggled. And I think getting through that year after the deployment was one of the most difficult things our relationship has been through or will ever go through. It wasn't the deployment itself because that was hard. It was hard on him to be alone with the kids. It wasn't really necessarily hard on me because I was just doing my job, right. right? But it's the coming home part and trying to get back into, back integrated into a life that is not the same as it was when you left. The kids, you know, have all grown. Um, the house is, you know, everything's different, right? And having to get back to work. Now think about coming back home, but now having to go back to work for the state police. Right, was, so. Was it, was it routine that, that was the difficult was it the emotional it was emotional i think it was routine i think it was missing what we had like like that core group of people that were deployed with me for that year that we were all each other had right mm -hmm. and now you've got to try to figure out how to wean yourself off of that and and sort of now start relying on your family you know and you, you miss you miss your buddies you miss the people you spent every day with you miss your routine you miss your um, and they had their own routine and they were in their own rhythm, right? He was a different kind of parent than, you know, maybe he might've been if I had been around and we had been doing it together. And, and for so, you to come back in and start, yeah, start being, yeah, it was picking up mom where he'd been doing both. Really difficult. Yeah. So we wound up going through a really tough time and um, it was particularly um, tough. We, we went to some counseling on our own. I, I, I sought out counseling and sought out a way to get for us to get through it on our own. I'd never told the army I was having a tough time because you'd never want to let anybody know you're struggling because I was afraid it was going to negatively impact my career. Right. right? Whereas now I look, I look back. And so, so that year post deployment, um, when I went back to work, my three on three off schedule for those three days that I went back to work again, 13 hour days. I leave the house at 7.30 in the morning, don't come back until 9, 9.30 at night. Um, the way I explain it, it might sound a little severe, but I was basically re-traumatizing my husband. Every time I went to work, he had to pick up where everything he had been doing, carrying, he had been carrying all of that for that whole year. And he was just, when I'd go to work for those three days, he'd have to do it again. And he's like, this, this something's gotta give. He goes, I can't, I, you know. So I started working nights. Wait a minute, you chose the word re-traumatize. Re -tra I feel like he was traumatized. But that's and that's why I said it's a strong word, but it's what happened to him. He was triggered. He was triggered by me going to work every day. It triggered him. He had to fall back into that role where I think he thought. Was he resentful? Probably. I would say yes. I mean, I'll tell you. So what happened that year is um, I went back to work. I switched to nights. I went to work nights, so I would work overnight, sleep a little bit in the morning, and then spend my afternoon with my kids, dinner, bath time, put them to bed, and then I'd go off to work again. So that way there, I was home for the critical parts of my kid's life, mm -hmm. right? Where he felt like he was holding the burden on the dinner, bath, bed, all that stuff. I was home for that. Um, and by the end of that first year, my husband said to me, um, something's got to give. He said, um, you've done enough. He said, and if you deploy again, your next husband can take care of the kids. And so I made a choice to retire. That's why I retired so soon post deployment. We made an emotional decision and I regret it. That's the one decision I regret to this day. We made a very emotional decision as a family. We were suffering, we were having a difficult time, and I felt like the burden of everything that was wrong with the family was squarely on my shoulders because of my occupation and because of what I was doing, and I had to make a decision. 
And because I had had 20 years and at that point, I chose to retire. So is it the decision that you regret uh, yeah. or that it was made emotionally? That it was made emotionally. So yeah. now I, I try to counsel a lot of young women on making emotional decisions, right? So you mean on not making, on not making, okay. on not, on how not to make an emotional decision, right? How to make sure you step back from, from That's what hard. we're emotional creatures. I know, but this was an extremely emotional decision and it was a definitive emotional decision I made for the benefit of my family. And I regret not being able to continue my career in the military. That's what I regret out of it. But, and my husband will tell you to this day, if he were sitting right here, and I apologize, Tom, wherever you are, that I'm bringing this up, but he'll, he regrets saying it. He says he regrets saying it. He wishes he had never said it. And he knows he said it. I don't, I don't know that, that I'm <laughs> going to let you apologize to him or him apologize because that's just life. That's yeah. reality. And there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough options for a soldier back then to say, I need to take a break. And now I think you can take um, some leave. Mm -hmm. You can take some leave without pay. You can take a little leave of absence. You can, you can remove yourself from the situation in order to help you make that decision. But I didn't feel like I had that option available to me back then. Well, back then we were still living under the, um, the cloak, if you will, of, you know, there's certain things that are taboo. Um, you know, I talked about when I got out of the, you know, Marine Corps, you did not submit for any, any kind of physical issues, you know, unless it was just, you know, blatantly obvious. Right. Um, you certainly didn't talk about any kind of PTS. No. I mean, it was just, it was kind of like, you know, the old, old school of, you know, you get your bell rung, you know, playing football, get back in there. Right. So. You know, you're right. It's it's a, it looks a lot different now. Mm -hmm. But you know, the emotional. I, I I still come back to what you just said a minute ago. You made an emotional decision, but we're emotional creatures. How in the world can you counsel anyone to completely get away with, from that if that's their makeup? Yeah, not completely get away from it. What I asked them to do is really reframe the problem, right? Oh, I love that. Right. Was the, is the problem like, so when I, I didn't have that kind of counsel for myself. Okay. So what I try to do is help them reframe what the problem is, right? So that when they're making a decision, so I've had, I've had young soldiers, uh, I mean, young troopers, not soldiers anymore, but uh, male and female, you know, difficult time. I think I might want to, you know, I don't know if I can do this, especially actually young moms coming back off of maternity leave. Mm -hmm. the, the, the initial instinct is I need to quit. I can't do this job. I'm not going to make it. And I have them reframe. I have them relook at what, the, what the issue is. Right. Um, and we, and we look at it from a different perspective and, and it helps them to realize, do you really, you don't really want to leave this job. You really need to figure out a way to make it work so that you're getting, you're feeling satisfied at home that you spent quality time with your family. And then you can come in and do your job, right? It's about that, that whole idea of the work-life balance thing. And I think that, you know, work-life balance is a farce. It doesn't really happen ever. But um, if I can help them relook at the problem and, and, and talk about it and talk through it, then they're not going to make that emotional decision sure. to just quit. Like I can't do it. Yeah. Well, I, I like what you said as far as reframing it because it, what it does is it, it compartmentalizes right. the 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 issue, the real issue, the real issue away from with. the emotional part of it. Right. Okay. Because when you're when you're making a decision from an emotional state, it's, it's the emotions are going to win. You know, generally. So you, you talked about some of the challenges you face on the um, uh, on the trooper side, and you told me off air that. Probably during COVID mm. was every bit as difficult on you as a deployment. Did I get that right? Well, I would say I equated it to a deployment, okay. right? We had one mission and it was to get everybody to work safely, to be able to work safely, right? So mm -hmm. we have to contact the public every day and they're, and you know, in the pandemic, they're telling you stay away from everybody, right? But now we can't. Like if the 911 call comes in, we still have to go to the house. We still have to go, you know, go to the accident, go somewhere, and you still have to be exposed. You have to expose yourself to what's, you know, potentially the pandemic um, or the or the coronavirus, you know, whatever. Um, so we had to find ways to operate um, in an environment that we weren't used to operating in. And that's very similar to taking a, a, 
you know, a National Guard unit and plucking them and putting them into the desert. You have to find a way to operate in a, in a condition and environment you're mm -hmm. not used to operating in. So we came together, we tried to figure it out, um, and we worked tirelessly every day. Like, I feel like I worked more hours during the pandemic um, on trying to make sure everybody was safe and make sure we had the right policies, procedures, and practices in place than I had in a long time on the state police. So, yeah. So what... What was the most, what has been the most difficult thing about being a state trooper? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Was it an aspect? Was it a time? Was it? I would go back to um, the times where I felt um, I would say, you know, maybe when I was a single mom, you know, nobody really under, it's the times when people don't really understand your, what you're going through. So I would take that, I would take, um, returning from the deployment was very difficult. I had some supervisors who didn't really understand what I had gone through or actually quite frankly here to understand what I had gone through. They just knew they had more personnel. Back and they just wanted me back out on the road, get out there and get, do your job. And, and that, that's, that's, that's actually kind of a sad narrative. We're trying to change that now. What is, what is the one day when you were serving in uniform, whether it was as a trooper, um, as a, as a soldier that the one day you don't want to relive? Hmm. Well, I would say the night I was working, the, the night of the crash, the G Jimmy Doherty crash, yeah. Walk me through that, what happened? Well, I was working a swap. So I was working with people I didn't, I wasn't familiar with. Um, and it was pouring rain. If I could tell you, when I say pouring rain, um, I left the house that night with no power. We had no power. We had high winds, bad rain, you know. Um, I left the house, it was pitch dark, I went to work, and um, we had been struggling all night with trees down, with crashes, and the call came in from our local police department that said there was a crash, you know, where, where it was, and um, I remember just being like, what the heck? Why can't they just handle this? Why do I have to go out in this pouring rain, pouring rain um, to this crash? Why can't they take it, right? Like what is going on? And I got there and um, the local officer was sort of pale and he looked at me and he goes, um, I, think it's, I think it's JD, like I think it's him. And he goes, but I don't know. So he almost called for help because he didn't know what to do, right? So that's why we got called there. And so I go up to the car and, you know, sure enough, it is him and he's dead and there's nothing, there's nothing at this point we can do. But I think what I don't want to relive again is that feeling of being helpless. Like I couldn't help him. And knowing that his wife was at home waiting for him to come home, I couldn't help her. I couldn't help anybody. And, you know, the whole reason I do what I do is to help people. And I felt the most helpless I had ever felt. And probably because they were somebody I knew, you know? I mean, I had been to, I don't know how many fatal crashes in my career, um, but this was a face I knew, and it was a family I knew that was affected by it. And it was our agency I knew would be affected by it. And so, and what unraveled after that was certainly, um, you know, everybody coming together by the next morning the job sort of knew and everybody was showing up at the barracks and we were all together you know it, it brings people together you know clearly but it's not the kind of together you want to be so and i just remember being numb that week um during the funeral i you know pull myself together did what i needed to do we did our we did our critical incident stress debrief and everything's great everything's great everything's great but really everything wasn't great, you know, so. But after that crash, 
um, what happened was I um, realized I had gone my entire career not managing my emotional um, baggage or the stuff that had been weighing me down. And as a result, that's where I realized I needed to, I was, you know, um, post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever they all are, they, they manifest themselves. But what happened after that crash is I had taken everything in my career that had weighed me down and it had just really put me down into one of the lowest places I had ever been. Um, and I wound up having to get myself some help. So I think that, that was one of the most difficult times in my career where I realized I was paralyzed um, by some of the things I had seen during my career, but also some of the trauma I had experienced during the, you know, the, the way I felt about my deployment and my family. Um, and so what came from that was, you know, maybe one of the best things I was able to get myself the help I needed. And now I feel like um, I'm able to help others. And I think that's the most important thing. The thing about um, the army and the stigma of mental, you know, mental well-being and mental health, it's, it's just as real in law enforcement, right? It's just, we're trying to overcome that stigma now where it's okay to need to get help or it's okay to talk to somebody. It's okay to, to feel a little affected by stuff that you see, but we're not there yet. I don't think we're there yet. And I think we need to get there. That's a hard thing to deal with. Yeah. But in the worlds that we've been in, it's unavoidable. Right. You know, again, it's what we accept as part of the, as part of the job. You know, and what we haven't even really touched on is, you know, another personal story of yours, and that's the fact that you're a two-time cancer survivor. Correct. I mean, through all of this. The hits just keep on coming. <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was sitting here thinking about it, and, you know, and I can, I can relate to a lot of what you've talked about, mm -hmm. but the two-time cancer survivor, how, I mean, yeah, how in the world? At what point do you throw your hands up and say, come on, I've had enough? Well, I think that's when you realize what you have. You know, I actually think that's where you take stock in where you are, where you're at, where you, what you have. And I think that is how you make every, the next day count, right? I think that's how you keep going and make the next day count. Um, you know, the diagnosis is the scary part. Um, I tell everybody um, it's that time between hearing it and and knowing what your treatment plan is. There's like a couple of week period before you see all your doctors and you get all that stuff done. And I remember again thinking I was going to die. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like again, like what is this all about, right? So I call my doctor and I said, my, my primary care and I said, I think I'm having a heart attack. Something's going on. Like, I don't know what's going on with my heart. And he's like, oh, no, I just need to get you a little Xanax. <laughs> he's like, you're going to be fine. He's like, that's anxiety. Like, I had so much anxiety between hearing the words and finding out, like, talking to the actual surgeons, the oncologists, and the doctors that I thought I was actually having a heart attack. Like, I thought. Um, so there's this feeling pre- and then there's that feeling after. All right, this is what we're gonna do. The doctor comes in, they have so much confidence. I have so much faith in my doctors. We're gonna do X, Y, Z. You're gonna go through this, that, that. And this is what we hope for. And this is what we're gonna, you know, this is where we'll evaluate, you know, surgery, uh, radiation, you know. I did not need to go through chemotherapy for my breast cancer. Um, luckily it was all contained when they did, I had good margins. And, um, and then it was a matter of maintaining, um, you know, some of the medication they want you to stay on. Cause I was, I was, I wasn't considered a young survivor, but I was young. I was in my, I was 45, 45, 46. But, um, so you stay on the medication cause the key is to not having it reoccur. And then within 12 months of, of a breast cancer diagnosis, I got diagnosed with a very rare form of melanoma. It's called subungal melanoma. It's in your nail bed. It has nothing to do with sun. It has nothing Interesting. to do with um, 1%. As um, a 1% chance of um, this type of melanoma happening in um, Caucasians and white, in white, you know. So, so I found it on my nail. I recognized. It. I said, "Is something going on here?" You've got several one percenters in your category. Yeah. yeah. So, so very rare. Um, and that was in within 12 months of the the breast cancer. So. Um, 
Luckily, I caught that early. The doctor tells me that was all my doing. By, by bringing it to my dermatologist's attention, they were able to get it before it spread. So, wow. so yeah, so that's a lot. But, I mean, when you turn around and look back at it, yes, I guess it is. But, I mean, I just, you know, keep going. Keep. So, a couple more questions. Is there, is there one day from your service that stands out above all other days from which you, you draw your inspiration, your life lessons? Is there one day that you can point to and say, that day right there was the day that really encompasses who I am? Mm, I don't know. You're about one days, aren't you? It's one bad day, one good day. <laughs> I don't think there's one specific day. I mean, I think I try every day to make every day count and every day be the reason why I'm, you know, why I raise my right hand and why I said I do the things I do. Um, no, I don't think there's one right now. Well, you said there were a lot of challenges that y'all faced um, through the uh, through the George Floyd uh, days. Oh well, right. So during the yeah during twenty twenty, and, and, uh, and obviously I'm not talking yeah. about that specifically, but I'm no, just uh, yeah. I mean, it was a it's a tough time. It's it still is a tough time to be in law enforcement. But those are those are times where you look back and um, you you sort of you know, take stock in why you chose to chose the career profession you chose. I think we all will say we chose to to be in law enforcement to help, to help, to help. That's all we want to do is help. You know, I mean, if you really look at it, mm -hmm. to help society, to help citizens, to help people. Um, and that and that narrative and what, and what played out and what continues to play out is that we're not the helpers anymore, that, we, you know, we can kind of be the enemy and that's not really very easy for us. I was going to say, it's got to be hard. Yeah, it's really hard. When you go into something with the intention of saying, I'm here to help you, but your intentions are, are misconstrued mm. and now you're the bad guy as a result of it. Right. What we try to do or what we try to focus on as an agency is, is that narrative that was playing out sort of in the media and nationally is not necessarily the narrative that plays out here in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we have, um, you know, sort of that much discontent you know with the with the um authority or with law enforcement here in rhode island we don't so we try to we try to 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 sort of detach ourselves from the national narrative and say let's look at how it is here we still have the support we need from the citizens we still have the support we need from our lawmakers and so let's just focus on that and let's just keep doing the right thing make sure we're training the way we should be training make sure we're um you know taking care of our people so that things don't escalate and get out of control. You know, a lot of times this personnel early warning thing is some is a buzz in law enforcement where what is that? Um, where you have certain certain triggers, right? So as an officer, we have it's called personnel early warning system. So like if things start to if 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 things with a specific officer starts to sort of add up, we have a flag that goes off that says, hey, somebody should probably check on him. Right? I see. If they it counts like use of force incidents, you know, motive it crashes and and citizens' complaints and things like that, so we can get to somebody before they've reached their breaking point. Yeah, and, and, uh, yeah. And I so think that's, that's a it. really, really important thing to bring up is that there are some bad actors. Let's, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, let's be honest. Everyone. But um, a lot of times, it's it's kind of like what you were talking about with your husband. You got home, and you know, there's a hole in the wall, and there's a dent in the refrigerator. That's not indicative of of who he is. No. But he got to a breaking point. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the same thing that happens with some of these officers. Now, it doesn't justify it, doesn't make it right, no. but that's the reality. So with, with that being said, I'm sure you have come across some of these bad apples too. Um, or have you? I mean, do you have you even had any bad apples on the force? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't think anybody's... Um immune to that right like no matter what your recruitment and selection process is and no matter how much you vet people and train people there's always going to be somebody who's not going to 
um, fit the mold, you know, or, or be not everybody can be perfect either. That's the sure. thing. You're not perfect all the time. So I think I think from a, a leadership perspective and from a command level perspective, it's about um, training, about giving them the right tools. And, and that's where I come at it from this wellness perspective. Like if they're having a problem, I want it to be OK for them to say they're having a problem right. from a leadership perspective. It's important to make sure that that we're just taking care of our people, keeping eyes on our people and making sure that everybody's meeting the benchmarks and, and performance and and has every, all the tools they need, you know, so that mm. I mean, that's where somebody was obviously allowed to go under the radar for so long or for however long or something happened somewhere yeah, along they, the way. They were unchecked. On, yeah, exactly. And that's what that's the thing that comes to my mind is that somebody dropped the ball. So somewhere. have you ever been involved in purging? a bad actor inside the troopers? Not me personally. No, our agency has had to had to do that, but Is there satisfaction in watching those people walk out? Never satisfaction in seeing something I mean Yeah, we want everybody to succeed. We want everybody to to do well. But if they're not doing well, it makes us all better that they walk out. You know, so we we, we talked about a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Um some good things, some not as fun things. Could you condense your service down into a lesson that you want young girls to, to take with them out into the world? Yeah. Um, if you have a vision or a goal or a dream, right? I know it sounds so, don't give up. Don't ever quit. Um, surround yourself with the right people who will help you get there. Um, and when things are tough and things are difficult, I mean, I think that's when we all have to dig deep down inside and find the reasons why we're doing what we're doing and just keep going. So kind of like when somebody puts a, uh, a quit slip in mm -hmm. front of you, don't give in to it if that's what you want. Right. Exactly. Well, final question. So, as you know, carry the load. We're about making sure we remember those who mm -hmm. never got to take off the uniform. Right. Um, so my question is, who are you carrying? So Holly Charette is United States Marine. Uh, she was killed in Iraq in 2005 while I was there. I did not know Holly. She was uh, working with the Marines while I, uh, we were in country at the same time. Um, I came to know the story of Holly. Um, when I came back uh, upon my return, I started working um, with an organization called Operation Stand Down Rhode Island. I actually, they were the beneficiary of a fundraiser we used to do on Veterans Day every year. It was called the Women Warrior Luncheon, where um, a group of people brought a bunch of supporters of veterans together um, to hear stories of women veterans. So it was called the Women Warrior Luncheon. And that luncheon, um, was to benefit the Holly Charette House. So Operation Stand Down runs um, transitional housing for homeless veterans. And there's one specifically for women uh, called the Holly Charette House. And Holly, the story of Holly and her, her parents, Ed and um, Regina, are just amazing. I got to know them very well uh, through that work. And now I encourage people, I, I've donated suits. So what they do is they try to help homeless women uh, and fam women with families too. Um, with job opportunities and to get housing, get jobs, get housing. So I've donated old suits. I've donated old, all old housewares to them so they can, there's certain, there, I've toured the house. There's different apartments where you can live. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think Holly, Holly's story is amazing, but I think Ed and Regina are carrying on Holly's legacy and I will carry Holly, um, you know, forever. And what, all the other Gold Star what, what families of Rhode Island. She uh, was killed by um, uh, an IED. She was, uh, yeah. Holly Sherratt. Holly Sherratt, yep. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah.